Why design matters. I think that'll work even better unmuted. How does that sound? Can't have a Zoom without a fantastic unmuting episode. Let's just get that straight out of the way. Why design matters and how hospitality can do more with it and better. How can design choices from things as small as takeaway containers to as large as building a whole restaurant affect the outcomes for your business? And how can those same choices improve our communities? Today, we talk to three people from different parts of the architecture and design conversation about the big challenges and the easy wins in the food and drink space. How it looks, how it sounds, and how it feels. While oftentimes we think about the design of a restaurant being about the build or about the placement of the bar, decisions have to be made about everything from the thickness of the paper in the toilets to the thinness of the glassware, from the weight of the typefaces and the color of the light bulbs to where you'll hang the coats and how you'll power your stoves. All of this is design. And all of this happens before you slice your first onion or pour your first cup. And all of it contributes to what your customers understand your restaurant to be. And all of it has long-term ramifications, not just for your bottom line and the sustained existence of your business, but for the wider world. Now, these, quest these questions existed before 2020, but in 2021, we find the pandemic has made some of them a lot more pressing. My name is Pat Nurse. I'm the creative director of Melbourne Food and Wine Festival, and I'll be your host today. Welcome to this latest in our series of industry forums presented with the support of Mr. Young. Housekeeping, which seems appropriate given we're talking about keeping houses. If you'd like to ask a question, by all means, enter it in the chat box, just down at the bottom of your Zoom screen there. I am a much better monotasker than multitasker as anyone who's been to any of these sessions before has probably noticed. And we won't have time to answer every question, but I promise I'll do my very best. To get to grips with why design matters, we're joined today by Eva Foskia, the founder, principal, and lead architect at IF Architecture. If you've dined your way around Melbourne, you'll almost certainly be familiar with her work on Marion, Cutler, Etta, and Attica. Welcome, Eva. We're also joined by Jeremy McLeod, the founding director of Breathe Architecture, a firm renowned for its focus on high quality urban design and sustainable architecture. Jeremy is perhaps best known for his work on the Nightingale model, which is an architect led open source model designed to deliver more affordable quality urban housing for Melbournians. And rounding out our panel today is Ben Shuri. In addition to being the chef and owner of Attica, one of Australia's most celebrated restaurants. Ben has a passion for design and architecture that extends far beyond his obsession with Grant Featherston chairs. This interest has led him to work with blacksmiths, glass blowers, writers, artists, basket weavers, fashion designers, and woodworkers in his search for restaurant design that is meaningful, durable, and connects with the story Attica tells about food in Australia. Welcome, Ben. Jeremy, I thought I might actually kick off with you. Thanks, Pat. Let's get to the, the, the crux of the question. Why does design matter? I, I mean, the funny thing is that, you know, often people will come to us to say, why do I need an architect or why do I need an interior designer? And um, we ask them that if they want a car, do they go to their mechanic and uh, ask someone to build them four wheels and put an engine in it and drive around, or would you like that designed? Uh, the funny thing is that design is the thing that contemplates everything from, you know, that, that's right, you know, with Ben, whether it's the glass, glass blowers or whether it's, you know, it's telling a story of where the food is sourced, right through to, you know, if, you're, if you care about sustainability, how do you power your cooktops? And how do you bring all that together to build a narrative for your, um, for your restaurant, to build a narrative for your customers and to build a story that people can engage with that helps you build brand and helps you deliver on your own mission? That's a disturbingly uh, fluent and uh, <laughs> sensible answer. Um, 
I'm not saying it's never happened in this forum before, but it certainly hasn't come out of come out of my mouth. Um, where do you start when you're having those conversations after people like reel for a second at the fluency and uh, good sense of that answer? What's the next question for them? Well, so for us, you know, I guess again, Ben, it's like you we sit down with you know our clients and ask them about the story of of their brand of of their restaurant what it is that they're trying to deliver to their customers what they're trying to deliver for themselves or what they're trying to deliver for the planet and then we use that you know um as a conceptual driver to drive the big conceptual framework for what it is we're trying to do um so for example with um uh, with Transformer, for Lucky Papadopoulos, which is kind of like the, the little sister to Veggie Bar. When we worked on that, it was all about seasonal food for Lucky. And, you know, when you, when you go there, what you'll see is each of the seating sections is like sitting in a garden plot, <laughs> you know, so there's kind of, you know, six seating sections, which kind of reference different garden plots. The central kitchen and bar is housed in what could, you know, conceptually be called the garden shed where all the tools are kept <laughs> no no pun intended for the chefs out there my apologies and then um you know at the back are the water tanks and and that's where all of the um, bathroom facilities are kept so it's kind of a simple idea about this you know literally uh you know quite a literal um take on this idea of of a garden you know of a market garden of you know of a you know post-war migration market garden in Australia or in Melbourne, and then that kind of expressed into an existing shell and you know turned into a dining experience. So, so I guess for us it's about you know, yeah asking what story wants to be told, and then how do we as designers help help the chefs um, and the restaurateurs and the front of house team convey that story to their clients. Eva, if I can, if I can turn that question to you, if I'm a if I'm a restaurateur and I come to you with a similar question, what's the what's the most direct answer when I ask what a firm like yours, what what IF Architecture can do for a hospitality business? Um, we can add value across multiple touch points, across nearly every touch point. Really, I think. The whole process of being an, an architect or a designer is interpreting in a built form, you know, the aspirations of that owner, of that operator, of that chef. And it's a way of interpreting all of that into something that's tangible and that can actually make an impact on the patron's, you know, special occasion, their, you know, first date or something for their lives. Um, so, and, and apart from the value that you can offer the patron in that way, it's also a you know, financial value. Really good design means, you know, better labour costs, better staffing, you know, less OH&S issues in the kitchen if you've got the heights of things designed well, you know, not too many steps between your cook line and the pass, all, all sorts of things. Um, Good design is all encompassing, I think, really. Now I'm gonna I'm gonna turn that around on the on the question of all encompassing and limitless. What are the limits of what you can achieve for your customers though? Um, there, there's always a there's always a limit. Um, I think it's it's a relationship between you and the client. I think both people have to be really open. The client has to be very open with you um, and, a, and a level of vulnerability because I think they have to give you as enough information so that you can interpret it in a way that actually works. Um, obviously there's budget limits, um, there's time limits, there's quality limits. You know, there's that you know, the age old triangle, quality time, money. Um, and, good. Mm, and often hospitality people have no time, very limited budgets and um, 
you know, quality. Everyone wants something of a really good quality, of, of course. But there's Do you ever have anyone come to you and say, I don't, I don't want quality? I just want it to <laughs> no. <laughs> <laughs> no. Um, so, you know, there's, there's, there's always a compromise across those, across those things. Um, it, it's always, it's a bit challenging, you know, a, a, it's any project is sort of challenging along the way, but I think it's the willingness, um, especially on the client's t- part to be as open, as transparent as possible from the very beginning that enables you to kind of get the, the best results. Ben, you've you've worked on some some restaurant designs, including the you know the refit of your own restaurant, Attica, and you know you've worked in other people's restaurants as well. You've had experiences in those things. If you were designing another restaurant for yourself tomorrow, what would be the the questions, the key things that you would ask of a designer or an architecture, uh, sorry, a designer or an architect when you were sitting down to sort of feel them out to see if they were a good fit for your business? I mean, I think it helps that I come from a background and a passion of design and architecture. It's a great passion of mine, as you mentioned at the start, beyond restaurants um, and the fact that it's become more consuming and real. Um, you've got categories. One of the things that I know um, from a passion of uh, um, residential architecture and a study of residential architecture is that the best homes that I've ever seen, the best homes that I've ever been in, have been one or two, one of two things. They've been either an architect's own home or they've been, um, if you let's say, a, a sympathetic owner's home who listened to the architect and almost uh, just handed the whole pr- process over to them and didn't really put any um, restrictions on them. Um, but in, in restaurants, um, it needs to be a balance of that because a restaurant, like a home, it's, it, it had, well, some would say that a home has to function as well. Maybe sometimes I see, you know, homes as being, out, being able to be art pieces as well. But, but in a restaurant, there's a very practical um, sense that needs to, you know, be first and foremost um, to, to restaurant design. And I currently am between two restaurants uh, that we own and run. And one of them um, is very well designed in certain parts. Um, that's the redesign of the dining room that Eve undertook four years ago, but incredibly poorly uh, in the kitchen storage back house space, because that was never designed by anybody. And that's just something that's evolved over time um and then on in the other venue um you know it's a only just been fitted out and that has a very um i designed the kitchen in a very low budget way there but that works very well um and so the difference between the two spaces and moving between them is um very very dramatic um and it has um many impacts on how the two businesses operate and how they're able to operate. One, you know, one is, one is uh, the kitchen at Attica, for example, the design of the kitchen at Attica, it's, it's split up between four kitchens, four small rooms. There's no site between um, any of them really. We have to communicate on walkie talkies. They have different flooring surfaces, different levels. It's uh, very, very difficult. Um, I've been working in that space for 16 years, so I'm used to it. Uh, and I thought it was fine until I left that space and went to uh, the summer camp kitchen where it is just a big rectangular kitchen and everybody's there together and your line of sight, like, you know, as the leader or the boss, your line of sight can be across everything all the time. No walkie talkies? No walkie talkies. Well, actually, technically there is a walkie talkie to the outdoor kitchen, but, um, uh, and then even in a perfect world, you wouldn't even have that outdoor kitchen as separate to the main kitchen, but um, it's just so much easier. It's, it's much faster. It's um, it takes less staff. It takes uh, it's a lot less mucking around. It's easier to maintain quality because um, everything's just much more manageable. But um, more than just being uh, easier and more efficient, it's also, in my experience, a more positive kitchen as well. So uh, the way that the space interacts with us psychologically is quite different. And um, that's probably like an underrated aspect of architecture and of design, of good design, as you know, 
as this way of improving our lives and this way of um, making us feel better. And most people will understand this if they've ever been into an amazing house that's just got a really good feeling. You know, generally that's as often down to good design um, and modernist houses from the 50s, 60s, 70s, which were my passion in particular, they often have that that feel about them, that the natural um, environment coming in through floor to ceiling windows and communal spaces and open kitchens and, and things that are now kind of synonymous with homes um, weren't always. And, and so I, I find that um, that's a really, really important factor in designing restaurants and kitchens as well, um, whether or not there could be any natural light in the kitchen, um, how easy it is to communicate, what is the color of the wall. Once um, a former owner of Attica painted the walls in a dark green color and it was um, so offensive. It gave us all headaches and immediately made us feel kind of down. Um, and it was painted out within a week. Um, it, I came back from the weekend, he painted the walls green, dark green, kind of glossy dark green, really full on in a small space, really dark. Um, and at night, just impossible. And, um, and so small, small things, uh, small element design elements can make big differences. Segue to Jeremy McLeod. Um, not to give you a total Dorothy Dixer, but here comes a total Dorothy Dixer playing to the crowd, or maybe not to the crowd, but certainly to the, the guest. Your, one of your areas of, expert, of expertise is sustainable design, sustainability in architecture. If I am uh, someone who runs or works in hospitality business and I am seriously committed to uh, making my business more sustainable, lowering my environmental footprint, what is the most important decision I can make in a new build? In a new build, it's easy. Um, take out the gas. So Take out the gas? <laughs> How am I going to cook? <laughs> so... As some of you, as some of you already know, uh, induction is forty percent more efficient than gas, um, and I know that it's a step change, um, and I know that it's tough depending on what you're cooking. But if you think about um, if we continue to plumb fossil fuels into our buildings, those buildings will have no pathway to net zero emissions. Let's so, repeat that. If we continue to plumb fossil fuels into our buildings, those buildings will have no pathway to net zero emissions. Net zero emissions. So we're meant to, if we're, if we're, if we're gonna meet our Paris climate targets, we're meant to halve our emissions by 2030. Obviously um, at the federal government level, there's no commitment to do that, but we as private citizens need to do what we can to affect market change towards that. And by 2050, if we're gonna keep global warming below two degrees, then we need to be working in a, in a built environment that has net zero emissions. So no carbon associated with the operations of those buildings. Can I burn wood? <laughs> so in answer to that, um, if, so can I, can I answer this the other way, Pat, which is if you're in an existing building and there's already gas infrastructure in there, there is all this embodied carbon in your building already. There's already embodied carbon in the gas cooktops if you've got a wood-fired pizza oven, there's already embodied carbon in building that pizza oven. When you burn wood, obviously you're emitting carbon. Um, when you're burning gas, you're emitting carbon. So the other way to do this, if, you, if you're not building from scratch, the single most important thing that we can all do as business owners is to buy 100% certified green power into our businesses. And what that does is that despite what the Morrison government does or doesn't do about renewable energy targets, it signals to the market that they have to invest in large scale renewables. So that's not um, carbon offset power by PowerShop. It's not carbon neutral power by Momentum Energy. It is 100% certified green power. It's independently audited, audited and that affects market change. Where do I get some of this 100% green power? You can buy it from any of the big dirty uh, uh, energy retailers, AGL, uh, Origin, Energy Australia. There are 30 Energy Australia um, retailers in Victoria, for example. Um, and so I'd recommend Momentum, Diamond, Ovo, or Energy Locals if you want some hip young kids to buy some power from. So none of those have any coal in their generation mix. 
But the important thing is you buy 100% certified green power. It costs you 4.5 cents a kilowatt hour more, which is hardly anything. And when you go to switch retailers, you negotiate hard on what your energy usage is and you'll get a better deal anyway than the, than the, than the power you're currently on. Um, and then the other thing, Pat, I would say is if you care deeply about the environment, then um, take your, your business carbon neutral. And to do that, uh, you, you basically do a carbon audit. So we engage a company called the Carbon Reduction Institute. There's another company called Pangolin. Um, there's about you know, 10 different companies in Melbourne or Sydney that will do that for you. So Carbon Reduction Institute for us as an architecture company audits our carbon emissions. So if we had gas or if we had a wood-fired pizza oven, it would look at what are our emissions related to that? What's our, uh, our emissions related to um, our waste or our food waste? And then it tells us what that is. It gives us a report on how we can look to reduce those emissions. And then it tells us, it gives us some options on what we can do to offset those emissions. Um, and so, you know, for us, we buy uh, two types of offsets. We buy some, some generation offsets uh, in biomass plants in India, but we also buy regeneration offsets in biodiversity and in trees on the East Coast and the West Coast of Australia. Um, so I know that for me, operating a business, that we operate a business that does no harm to the planet. Um, so there's ways around that. If, if you're leasing a space that already has gas in it, or if you've just recently spent on a whole bunch of gas infrastructure, there are ways around you know, um, dealing with your carbon emissions associated with that. And then you can run a carbon neutral business. And businesses like me will want to trade with you. We'll want to have our events there. We'll want to come there for um, you know, big events. Eva, uh, when you, if you, I don't know if you do this, but if you put the suggestion to your hospita hospitality clients that they use induction, what do they say? Well, they haven't said anything yet. <laughs> this is the, we often have that discussion with our residential clients. Um, and to be honest, there's been a really positive switch to a lot of our clients going to induction. Um, we... Um, even talking to clients about um, electric hot water as well in their homes on top of, you know, water tanks and other things that they can do. So the switch, especially in, we do a lot of residential work where it's, um, they're not necessarily new builds, you know, they're additions or renovations to existing homes. Um, and the, the sort of uptake to induction or the positive conversation around induction has been really good. Um, in terms of hospitality, um, that's, yeah, we haven't actually had that discussion with anyone recently. It would be really interesting to see what the sort of um, feedback was like. Let's um, try it theoretically right now. With Ben. With Cloud, uh, ben Shuri, you know, Eva's busy. She can't take his business right now. He's talking to you. He's doing the Attica winter camp. <laughs> uh, it's going to be amazing. You heard it here first on Melbourne Food and Wine Festival. We're currently doing Attica winter camp still. Two more weeks to go, Pat. Just Jeremy, put, put the pitch in to, uh, you know, um, Melbourne, this is probably Mel, you know, certainly Melbourne's most internationally famous chef. This would be, you, you know, you might get a booking at Attica if you land the contract and make your wife happy. How, how can you pitch him? How, this could be a real coup for this, uh, for this particular message to hospitality in Australia. Yeah, you know, to be totally honest, Ben, I don't think it would be a hard sell for you. Like, I, I think that you get the importance of climate change. Um, I think that, you know, we would need to talk about, you know, what sort of technology you need and, um, and does it do what you need it to do? Or is there a way to transition slowly towards, you know, um, an all electric infrastructure? Or do we, do we do a combination of mainly electric and then some offsets? Ben Shuri, can we sign you up for a no gas kitchen here now live on international television. First of all, um, I, I think uh, Uncle Roger is going to be very upset with you, Jeremy. I'm, I'm not sure if you're aware of who Uncle Roger is. You guys heard of Uncle Roger before? Only in meme land. <laughs> when you look up Uncle Roger, he breaks down um, bad renditions of egg fried rice uh, on the internet. He's a fictitious <laughs> character by American comedian. 
and uh, it's really great. Anyway, he he, he does not advocate for uh, induction cooktops at all. <laughs> It's impossible to run a walk on it. You can't have it. You can it. Every time that he watches a video and he sees somebody cooking on induction, he says there has to be a fire. Um, for me, I mean, I come, you know, I guess I came up cooking in the in the in the eighties and the nineties, and gas has always been, you know, like our fuel of choice. Um, and it is it is better than induction, just in a practical sense. I'm not talking about it as um, from an environmental sense. I think. Um, just practically, if I just if I'm just giving you a cold hard facts as a cook, um, for me cooking on gas is is superior right now than cooking on induction, um, and that's coming from a kitchen where there is a combination of induction and gas uh, in the kitchen, um, and a combination of gas appliances beyond cooktops and electric appliances. Um, but that said, um, that is kind of my old school preference, um, and it is more probably rooted in uh, my own and, and my industry's inability to kind of change. It's not necessarily the most dynamic industry in, in the world. And we're not always at the cutting edge of, of modern changes, whether it be, um, you know, social or um, environmental. And I would also also say, I think that restaurants, particularly sustainable businesses, maybe sometimes the most unsustainable. Um, that said, the cooking that we do do on induction, I can't, I could imagine, um, given uh, Jeremy's quite persuasive arg argument um, for uh, for saving the planet and also trying to, which links into my business philosophy anyway, which is kind of to do as little harm as possible. Um, you know, do the best work while not stuffing everything up is basically you know, my philosophy on business. Um, that it wouldn't be that hard actually to move Attica to all electric. Like I think right now, probably the most crucial appliance in our kitchen is electric. And that is a, a it, that is a, an oven, um, a very technologically advanced oven designed by Porsche and built in Germany. Um, and that is electric. And that is really like kind of probably the only thing that's really non-negotiable um, in terms of what I need to have, what I need to speak with. Um, the fact that we are doing some cooking on induction cooktops and some on gas is more of a reflection of that. Um, they haven't been able to afford uh, an induction, um, a big induction stove. And two, I've, we've always had the gas. So it's kind of there, like you said earlier, Jeremy. But no, I don't think, I think in a new build, um, it would be very, it would be very easy. Um, and I think like anything, uh, there's just a period of time where you've got to get used to, you know, that change. I, I thought it would never be possible to get rid of glad wrap in the kitchen. We were able to get rid of glad wrap. Um, you know, I thought it would be possible to reduce our landfill. We we're able to reduce our landfill significantly by drying the scraps of the food that are left over and returning them to farms. Um, you know, we're on the on the cusp of eliminating the cryovac machine, which is a relatively new appliance in my career. Um, and that obviously has terrible plastic bags um, that it produces that are, you know, worse than glad wrap, way, way, way worse than glad wrap. And um, we're down to one or two essential jobs. And I, and I can see a path out of that appliance, which has only really been around in commercial kitchens for probably a decade, seriously. What are you going to do for apprentices' clothes when they've just started the business if you can't cryovac them? There's always the blast chiller, right? <laughs> <laughs> that's intolerable but that's the old that's the old world but no no can i just say that it's really interesting you know trying to build a future city that's decarbonized um it's been really really hard like we built uh our first carbon neutral building and it is an apartment building in brunswick nightingale one um in 2013 and when we did it um everyone said you, you can't do it because you need gas hot water and all of the residents want gas cooktops, you know, um, yet in Europe, everyone's using uh, packaged heat pumps, CO2 heat pumps to do the high efficiency hot water heating, uh, which is much more efficient again than gas. Um, and of course, when we provided induction cooktops for the residents, like no one, none of the residents who were living there pushed back. But what's really fascinating working with big developers on big projects um, you know, we'll there'll be 500 apartments on a project we're working on and we're trying to deliver a carbon neutral building. And then there's one tenancy downstairs 
And of course they say, oh, but we need gas in there. In that, you know, there's 50,000 square metres in this building. There's uh, 200 square metres down there and we need gas into there. So we can't build a carbon neutral building because it might be a cafe and they'll want gas. Um, you know, I mean, it's incredible. We've been able to kind of shift mountains, but, you know, when it comes down to it, the project managers and development managers are saying, no, we, ha we you have to plumb gas into, you know, even, you know, some crappy little tenancy in the, you know, in the back blocks of Thornbury somewhere, you know, because someone thinks that a cafe operator might want to go in there. And if they do, they have to have gas. It's, it's fascinating. But that's the barrier. To wrench this conversation from the huge importance of your choice of energy, which is hugely important. But Sorry, I think Pat. we've made that point. No, no, I'm, I'm really glad. But I think there's a, a segment of the audience who has signed up for this design um, discussion also to hear about aesthetics. Um, Eva, I'm going to throw this one to you, not least because I really like your taste in aesthetics. What are some easy wins? Well, what are, actually, what are the things if we want to make a space look and feel fantastic, where do we spend and where can we maybe save a few bucks? Where, where can we, where do we not actually have to spend that much money in terms of what the look and feel of the finished place will be like? And where should we actually not skimp in your opinion? Well, it, it, it probably leads on from the discussion that we were just having actually. But I think, you know, invest in some good quality design pieces. They don't have to be replica. You don't what need to... What do you mean by that? Do you mean furniture? Dumb it yeah, down because I am not fluent in Yeah, let, we'll say furniture. You mean tables because and chairs? Tables and chairs, yep. The, the sort of biggest things in a, in a restaurant or a cafe or a hospitality space. You know, they're the things that people sit on and touch um, and they're also one of the biggest expenses in terms of a fit out. And I think there's a lot of fit out around that. Um, or there's a, there's a bit of thinking that, um, you know, it's better to, you know, have something that looks good, but it might be a, a ripoff or a fake or a replica, which following on from the conversation that, you know, Jeremy and Ben were just having, you know, that's terribly bad for the environment. You know, it's been made all of the time. It's been made offshore in we don't know what types of conditions. Um, you know, to be sold back here in Australia for a really cheap price, um, which there's lots of amazing, very good young designers around that are small producers that are producing amazing product for not much more than the same price, you know, a lot of the replica products don't last very long. So even if you're not spending much money right now, you'll be replacing that furniture because we hope that your venue is really successful and you've got lots of bums on seats. So you'll be replacing that furniture pretty quickly as opposed to potentially investing just a little bit more and having something that lasts you a very long time. And that's also supporting the local industry, local design, or even, even if it's from overseas but just a you know a good authentic furniture piece which has maximum impact as well because like I said you know it's the things that it's bums on seats and people are touching your tables and looking at your chairs and you know visually when you walk into a venue the biggest thing you one of the biggest things you see is, is tables and chairs so I think investing in, in good furniture good design in that way is probably one of the biggest things you can do um, and has such a broad, big impact across across so many different industries as well. You know, sort of on the outset of COVID last year, you know, there's you know big talk about the effect of the hospitality industry and you know what it the employers um, to employees, but there's also the second and third and fourth tier ring of people that the hospitality industry supports. And the hospitality industry does support people, you know, businesses like mine, architecture, but also small manufacturers, tradespeople, contractors. So, you know, it, it has a real ripple effect. And I think that if you're, you're you have good values um, and sort of you, you'll take that through to everything, you know, it makes a really, really big impact. 
I'm 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 going to press you guys on this question because um, I'm as cognizant of the fast, cheap, good question as anyone else. But it is a question we get a lot, and it was it was a question um, that was asked uh, when we were um, promoting this this forum online. What if I don't have a million dollars? Is is there any point in talking to a a serious design or architecture firm or am I stuck? You know, are there things that you can do for me? Are there things that I can do for myself with less money? Ben Shuri, you just put your hand up. Yeah, I would say that that's an excellent uh, question and great thing to talk about. Um, and I can talk about it from my unique perspective, which is I never have a million dollars to spend on a restaurant. <laughs> um, as an independent owner, I... He's nodding along here. I see that. I, well, yeah, far less. In fact, at the budget for the Attica dining room initially, when Eva did it, was $200,000. Um, I ended up spending quite a bit more than that by my own choice. Um, but um, I remember before I did that, I was talking to an architect friend and they said to me, I wouldn't even look at anything for under $800,000. This was maybe eight years ago. Wouldn't even look at it. And I remember thinking... Mm, they wouldn't, they suggested as an operator, you wouldn't look at anything for a dining room refit under $800,000. Wouldn't even talk to anybody. And I remember thinking, oh my goodness. Because you won't get a chair? What What was the rationale there? Yeah, they couldn't do the work that they wanted to, I suppose. I'm not sure what it was. I mean, it's ego um, for sure. How many square feet are we talking about here, Ben, in the space you're talking about? I didn't even know the size of managements, to be honest, Pat, but just wouldn't even contemplate any, for any job. I mean, I don't get out of bed for less than 800K. Can I, can I just can I just say that not all architects or designers are like that, Ben? So oh no no I'm not and I'm 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 coming into the defence, Jeremy. Um, but that was my that was my initial experience, and I think that if you hit up the wrong people, um, that that can be maybe the feedback that you get. Um, and the, but the thing is is that um, I think it's essential for people on all budgets to work with architects. Um, that's my argument, and. You don't actually need a lot of money to work with an architect or a designer, um, but I think that that whatever that investment is, and it's and, and I'll be completely honest, a relatively small investment when you take into account, you know, what you're spending on fitting out any kind of restaurant or cafe. Even if it's even if you only have a hundred thousand dollars, I would implore you still to contact an architect. Um, now, there's there's some architects that will, will probably won't take on that work, but there's plenty that will. And I, I would say that it's, it's crucial because there's just things that architects do that, you know, I think hospitality works, we think we can do everything and myself included, I'm definitely guilty of that, but we can't be good at everything. And one of the, the things that I've learned most in business is that it's really, really important for me to employ experts in the areas that I don't know about. Um, and one of the simplest things is, is the choice of colors, um, you know, and it just, it's just going back to the most basic, like one of the most basic forms is, I think choosing colors for interiors is incredibly difficult. Um, and so even when I was doing a pop-up in the Arrow Valley recently and I had the smallest budget um, and everything I'd bought was secondhand, and, but I still wanted it to look great. Like I still have a standard. You know, I contacted Eva who, who did a, a, a design for the dining room. And, but one of the crucial things that I was contacting Eva about and engaging her was because I knew that she would nail the colors of the space. And I knew that by nailing the colors, colors of space, it would look awesome. You now, because it looked like it was a it was a dog of a place before, and um, so so that um, that's crucial. But also um, the other thing why you should always engage an architect is just for to get some kind of semblance of a floor plan that's going to maximize the space and therefore um, enable you to be able to make the, have the best chance of making a profit ultimately. Um, It'll make it more pleasant for your staff to be there and hopefully you'll be able to retain them for longer because it was thoughtfully put together and they weren't falling over themselves all the time, et cetera, et cetera. But can I zoom in on that point? Can I just freeze and enhance there, Ben? I think it's a point worth looking at. The decisions you make with your design now will, it's like, you know, how you talk about amortizing the spending you do on the build, on the build because it's going to last this long. There's an inverse effect of that where, if you don't think think this through, that could equate to, let's say, have a better chance. Staff member being required for every service 
for every yeah, time yeah. you open your restaurant every week, every year for the next 10 years. And yeah. we're talking about a really large amount of money then. And your absolute best opportunity, your best chance is before, you know, you put a shovel on the ground, so to speak, um, before you've done anything. And doing anything once you've opened, as we all know, it's incredibly difficult. It's incredibly expensive to close. You've got to do it at the start. And I, I, I think that it's essential for hospitality people to, to go to an architect at when they're formulating their business plan. Like you've got some idea what you want to open, but it's got to be part of that. It's got to be from the very beginning. And then you can build in that design and that cost into the total spend. But I, I, would, I would really, really advise against not using one. I know that I'm, I'm, um, I'm becoming uh, you know, some sort of advocate for Architects Australia or whatever the governing body is. But, um, but just my experience, having, having gone through it without an architect and have gone through it twice now with an architect, um, and have worked at countless places that have had great design and, and, and countless that have had horrible design, um, is that the, the amount of money, it really ends up being really very little. I think, you know, if you're with the right architect, they always feel like great value, you know? Um, Jeremy, Eva, what do you want hospitality operators to come to you with? What do you want them to have really clear in their mind? Like what's, a, what's the beginning of a good conversation that you, in your experience, will result in a build that everyone's happy with or as happy as they can be or a design that is, is everyone can be happy with? Eva, do you want to go first or do you want me to kick it off? Yeah, I'll, I'll go, Jeremy, thank you. Um, put simply, a, a vision, like a really strong vision they don't have to come to us and know what colour they want to do things or, you know, that they can leave that to us. You know, what, but if they came to us with a business plan, even if it might not be 100% complete. Wait, 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 wait. You're talking about having a business plan before you open yes. your business? Yes. What? <laughs> yeah. Um, I, you know, obviously we've had plenty of experience where people have, um, come to us without that um, you know like some of those venues have never been built so um, and I think yes a business plan you know some research lots of research you know a menu even you know what are you hoping to achieve um, some realistic ideas about who your competitors are where they are where the site may be, you know, we've been involved with clients who have come to us before they've even found a site, you know, and have said, you know, we're looking for a site. Can you help us in, um, can you come and see this space that we're looking at? And that we've been able to, you know, really quickly offer some really good advice based on what their idea for their offer is. So, you know, even at that early point, to get us involved for only a little bit of time, I think can make a massive impact. I think if, you're, if your vision can be dot points on a page, some images, but just a strong semblance of what you're trying to achieve at a really early point is great. We've, we've got a really detailed brief document which goes through you know, who your patrons, who do you imagine your patrons might be? Um, where do they go? What do they do? Trying to understand the clientele, the demographics, the demographics of the area. Um, we've got detailed lists about your equipment. All of that we can work out with you. But if you don't have a, an, an idea from the very beginning, it's, it's impossible for us to come back to you with a narrative or a complete story that meets that vision when your vision you don't you don't have one or the target keeps moving or the goal co goalposts keep moving yeah and look um i would agree totally pat that that a vision helps us bring the best to our client so and you know when mark dundon came to us and wanted to do a roastery you know down in south melbourne you know which was sonali before he sold it to sell like he came to us with a clear idea about what that was you know and when he wanted to do seven seeds, you know, he, he came to us with a clear idea about like a, you know, like a big sustainability mission alongside with that, you know, farm to cup. And, um, and so seven seeds, you know, had water tanks and all this kind of, you know, all this stuff that kind of, you know, spoke to that narrative. Um, and, um, and then when he, and when he wanted to find seven seeds and brother Bob Boudin, 
he didn't have sites, but he took us to go and look at those sites to say, will that, will that work? And on to Ben's point about no jobs under $800,000, <laughs> Brother Bubba Boudin's 35 square metres, it was a 50 grand fit out. We bought 200 chairs and hung them from the ceiling on cable ties, you know, and it was done in two weeks. It was meant to be there for a year. It's been 10 years now, <laughs> 11 actually, and it's still going strong. And heaps of Have you checked was... the tyres lately? Are they okay? <laughs> One of the chairs just actually collapsed recently, Pat. It's like it all just fell apart. But a lot of that was actually Mark. Like, you know, he's a client with a really clear vision himself. And I think that what the way that we've been able to work with, with, our, with clients like Mark or Lucky or uh, Sasha from On Our Coffee is that we build a relationship with them where we trust each other. So when they tell them, say to me, this is their budget, I take it incredibly seriously. I'm like, okay, that's the budget. And I ask them questions like, does that include, does that include the, the furniture? Does it include, you know, the equipment? What does it include? So we understand all of that. So we know exactly what we've got to build for. Um, and then we work our way, we work our way back from there. Um, they trust us, we trust them and we work together. And when it comes to, you know, yeah, if someone has a clear vision for us, you know, Eva's right, it's, it's so much easier to build a narrative and a clear, a clear design around that. You know, it's, it just makes it so much easier when someone tells us this is what's in my mind and I somehow want to convey that to my people. Give me some easy wins, people. I, I am obsessed with uh, possibly being the rudest party guest you've ever met for, for you know, some of the obvious reasons some, and some reasons not so obvious, which is I will subtly go and turn your lights down. I will quietly suggest that you put some music on. If you have indirect lighting, I will switch that on. If you have direct lighting, particularly if it's like blue colored light bulbs, I will gently suggest you switch those off. Are there some equivalent wins that you can suggest for people who are in their restaurants, cafes, bars, whatever today? And they could be aesthetic, they could be environmental, they could be atmospheric. How can we make the spaces we're in right now more pleasant places to be for us, the people who work in them, and for our customers. Ben Shuri, go. Well, I'm just thinking of like one from the environmental angle is um, to start to refuse packaging from your suppliers. Um, I mean, you've got to pay to get rid of that. It's terrible for the environment anyway, but also as restaurant owners, we've all got to pay for that to be recycled, to be sent away. But what about if you just needed them all one day? Hey guys, we're not, I'm not going to be taking that anymore. So either bring it in something that can be reused and returned, uh, like our fridge supply does, um, or we're just going to unpack it and give it back to you until you stop doing it, um, which is what we do. Um, and one of the worst is, of course, polystyrene. You know, one of the worst offenders is, you know, it ends up in our bay, in the lovely Port Phillip Bay. It's never going to go away. It's there forever, pretty much. Um, for so, so long that it might as well be forever. Um, so that's just that's a little thing that you could you could initiate right now, um, and tell you what if they you know if they want to continue to have your business and they listen about it as well. And I, I I've noticed changes um, you know since we started doing that probably five years ago. I'm gonna I'm gonna do a quick interjection. I was in a restaurant the other day, won't name it. <clears throat> um, every customer was my age or older half of them had their phones out looking at the menu, lighting it up. And I thought, <laughs> this is my restaurant. And I looked out every day and I saw all of my customers, all of them needing to use their phones to read the menu. I mean, maybe I just turn the lights down and hopefully get rid of all these old codgers once and for all. Or maybe I would print the font a little bit bigger, cool font still, very cool. And maybe find a way to turn the lights up, even though I just said that you should turn the lights down. I don't know, there's solutions there, lighting solutions that spotlight table, the menu while still keeping it nice and dim. Also very good for Instagram folks, if you're on the popular image sharing social media platform. Um, Jeremy, what do you reckon? What, is, what are some things we can do to make our, the spaces we inhabit when we eat and drink more pleasant straight away? 
So quick Angel win. Lance, I think I see up in the background behind you. I can't <laughs> yeah. remember the name of that guy, but I love that guy. He's yeah, a- that's that's just, uh, there's a couple in there, but that the, the one, main one you're seeing is Devil's Ivy. It'll grow anywhere without light and it only needs water once every two weeks. So Ooh. pretty easy. Um, so look, you know, step number one is lighting 100, 100% Pat. And I, and I think that we, we need to understand color temperature. And so, you know, what Ben's talking about in a home, what you generally have in a home is warm white light, you know, somewhere between kind of, you know, generally about, anyway, I won't go into details, but it's warm white. It's not cold light, right? It's not, you don't want to be in a butcher shop. And the other thing is making spaces out of light. So you can have a dark, uh, very ordinary building. Writing this down. <laughs> um, but um, Eva's right. If you buy some good furniture, and the great thing about furniture um, is that it has an end of use. Uh, you know, it has another life after, you know, if you keep it for 10 years and then you decide to change or do something else or get something else fresh in. But if it's a Featherston, it has a value and it can go on and be used by someone else. It doesn't find its way to landfill like a built-in bonquette seat like a built-in piece of upholstery. So, you know, loose furniture has a life beyond your restaurant. Um, And then you can create spaces. So even, you know, you know, virtual seating sections out of light. So pools of warm light. And you're right, Pat, you want a pool of light, you know, over the place where you're eating. So you can see the food that Ben's bringing out to you. You can see the menu. Um, You can see what color the wine is that's being poured into your glass. And the other thing is, I think that um, plants are really easy. So, um, you know, and I know that let's let's take the style idea of plants off the table and instead let's think about the psychological and physiological impact of plants. Um, And there's a whole bunch of work that's come out of Harvard Business School, which is resulting in changes to workplace design and plants are being designed in because fundamentally they improve people's physiological outcomes. So they bring down people's heart rate, they reduce the instances of um, stroke, uh, heart attack, hypertension. Um, they also improve people's cognition. Uh, they make people feel less anx- anxious and they take less time off work. So even as an employer, you put plants in your space and suddenly it actually, perhaps it means people take less sick days. Um, and then look, lastly, um, I think that we've got, we've lost the art of acoustic design. You know, I've been into too many spaces lately where it is just, you know, I'm sitting in a cuboid room that's uh, all hard surfaces um, and there's not, nothing absorbing sound except the people in the space. And it becomes very tiring as a patron sitting there trying to have a conversation. And what happens with people in a volume when they're drinking, in, in a space when they're drinking, is that everyone keeps on talking slowly louder over time until you don't even realise it, but you're yelling. And at the end of the night, you feel exhausted. And I don't even know what it must be like for front of house staff. Um, so I think- Permanently impairing is, is one take on that. <laughs> yeah, so I think that, you know, it's really important to think about acoustic design and that can be handled a number of ways, like, you know, uh, changing planes, putting in acoustically absorbent material, you know, mm-hmm. so whether that be rugs or wall hangings or curtains or, um, you know, or, or acoustic panels, you know, under the tables or on the ceiling, but think about, that I mean, and it's hard to it's that's one thing that I really find it's hard to get clients to pay for because you know you can't see it when you prepare a kind of 3D model of the space. They're like, what's what's this what's this line item for acoustic treatment? Um, but it's one of those things that that you know, and Ben, I, I agree a hundred percent that when you design you should think about a home because what people essentially want is that third place when they come, they want to feel comfortable. And um, you know, when acoustics are really, really challenging. I think that people are less likely to return, and they don't even know why. I think I think what you're saying um, about acoustics is just one of the most underrated functions of good design, actually, and and critical to the success of a cafe or a restaurant or any kind of hospitality business. Eva, um, sort of follows on from that, but one thing in an, in any existing space, I think one quick thing that you can do is actually. Think about your table arrangement, your floor plan, your sort of layout, and actually sit in every chair yourself. Mm-hmm. Maybe have a coffee or you know a meal there. I think one of the things that can really change a space is patrons feeling really disconnected from a line of sight. You know, 
facing a wall, having their back to the room um, and just small changes like that, like moving all your chairs and tables out, you know, and putting them back in with that in mind so that each person in the space actually has a view to something, you know, either a view to outside, a view to the kitchen, even a view to the waiter station so that they're actually engaged and they're part of the whole dynamic of the space is something that any operator in an existing venue can do tomorrow. And I think there's, you know, there's in, in the past, you know, there's sort of the real push to put in as many people as possible. But a lot of the times you can have a completely different take on a venue just from where you're seated. If you're mm. seated and you're looking at a wall and there's there's no mirror reflecting the space behind you or there's no artwork or anything, that could be a really dud experience for you. Or you could be right in the corner window, have the, you know, the whole expanse of the venue in front of you and you could walk away thinking this is the best place ever everyone so who think, sits in that seat next to the toilet who cops the waiter's elbow on there on yes the go through is going to walk away however many people that is a week going man restaurant patna sucks i'm never going there again you don't want those people being negative ambassadors for you try and eliminate the b and c and d grade seats in your venue and that will cost you nothing brilliant slam dunk i want a really quick whip around but before i do that because I'm the least qualified person to say this, but I go to a lot of restaurants. So I want to throw one out to you in the audience. Think about how you arrange your tables for two. Uh, I love whether I'm with uh, my excellent girlfriend or a business conversation. I really like it when I go to dinner and it's not the one-to-one -one seating. And often this actually has advantages depending on how your restaurant is laid out. I love that American or European style where it's a two kind of facing the room it's kind of fun it's kind of cool and there's good reasons to do it space wise it doesn't work for every restaurant or cafe certainly but have a think about it last whip around friends and i'm going to go straight back to you eva because why not you're, you're next to me on the screen here <laughs> who's getting it right in australia who has a space right now ideally one that you guys didn't design or run yourself but where do you go in Australia, old or new, where you think, wow, this place works. This is so inspiring. I love this. Let's say Melbourne. Let's make it Melbourne. Let's make it Victoria. Melbourne. Yeah, well, well, I love, actually, it's, I really like Hero. It's a Chris Aaron Connell. Martini's new restaurant at the Australian yeah. Living Image. Yeah, I love, I, I've been there a couple of times. And, you know, it's quite, it's very minimalist in design. I think it suits the, the location, you know, it's at Acme, you know, it's, it's essentially a, a public space off a public facing square. So, you know, it's, it's going to get a whole different range of people and a whole different range of price points. Um, I love that they've got sort of a takeaway or sandwich thing at the front of the space. So you can kind of grab something and um, just eat sort of in the foyer. Um, and I just, you know, it has a you know, good feel sort of about it, even though it's not in design, it's very, very, very pared back. It's not, you know, intense in colour or fabric or, you know, anything along those lines. It's actually very simple, but it just, it feels good. And I think, you know, that's the, probably the sign of a great venue. You don't actually know quite why it's so good. You just you know, whether it's the service, the food, the environment, the music, you just know that it's good. And when you walk out, you just want to tell everybody to go there. That's a great answer. I, I know exactly where you're coming from there. Ben Shuri. I'm going to just duck the trend on the question a little bit. Um, I just wanted to leave with a couple of things that I think uh, hospitality people should know when engaging architects and designers. Um, one of them is I think you should question um, the durability of the surfaces. Uh, always. Um, is it going to look good for 10 years? What's the maintenance going to be like? And on maintenance, one of the things that I do in my business is, is I kind of put somebody in charge of checking the dining room every day in terms of are there any scratches in any paint chips or anything like that on the walls? And that person is then going to repaint them, um, which ensures that uh, our place always looks loved and cared for. And thirdly, when the designer presents you with their design um, and the layout of their floor plan, 
really look at the measurements very, very closely to make sure that they've left a practical amount of space to pass through passages between tables. And if you're not sure, grab, go and grab a budget truck and on the, on the day that you're closed and a bunch of tables and chairs and go to like a football field or a park and take that design and your measuring tape and some tables and try to lay it out um, and try to walk through it and get a sense of what it's actually going to be practically like to be there every day because it's not always, it's not a perfect science. My food is not always perfect. Design is not always perfect. Um, and you just give yourself the best chance of success if you understand what that's going to be like. And on the last question, very quickly, uh, on uh, great space, I mean, Francois is pretty enduring to me. Um, the, not just the design, even though somebody, some people would say that's a difficult design. Uh, I just think the place always feels great. Yeah. Jeremy. I asked a question, but you could do a Ben Shuri and speak to any point you like. The, right. the floor is yours. All right, cool. I, I want to put a classified out there in a minute, Pat. But um, just just on the acoustics, like um, I've been thinking, you know, as um, Ben and Eva were talking about, what's the place that I keep on going back to? And, um, you know, and this is a place that I'm not sold on the aesthetic at all, but I continually find myself going there, and that's Maha. And if I ask myself why that is, it's actually, I think it's all about the acoustics because I can go there on a table of two or on a table of six and have an intimate conversation in that place. So it's incredibly uh, acoustically warm there. So yeah, it's, I mean, it's a weird aesthetic, but it's, uh, you know, it's a great place to go and dine. So that's that one. Can I put out my classified, Pat? Please do, Jeremy. That's why we're here. All right. <laughs> Thank you. So um, uh, hello, everyone. Um, we're just about to finish Nightingale Village, which is um, Australia's first carbon neutral precinct with um, six Nightingale buildings by six of um, Melbourne's best young up and coming architects. On the ground floor, we've got um, six different retail tenancies, and one of them is for hospitality. And we're looking for a hospitality operator to come into that space that cares about um, being part of a carbon neutral building that doesn't mind cooking with electricity. <laughs> um, uh, and that, yeah, that wants to be part of um, an incredible place in Brunswick. So if anyone out there is looking for a new space um, post COVID, uh, it's between 200 and 300 square meters. Um, let us know. And um, yeah, you can find me at jeremy at nightingalehousing.org. Otherwise just ask Pat. Just ask Pat. Yeah. Thank you, everyone. Uh, this has been a Melbourne Food and Wine Festival industry forum presented by Mr. Yum. I'd like to give a big shout out to Melbourne Food and Wine Festival's presenting partner, the Bank of Melbourne, and our destination partner, Visit Victoria, uh, all people who care about great design as much as we do at Melbourne Food and Wine Festival. I'll be right back here in one month discussing I haven't finalised it yet, but I think we really do need to talk about the hospitality staffing crisis because that is probably the number one challenge facing everyone in hospitality right now. So if you think that's a good idea, raise your hand. Um, but for now, I've really enjoyed this conversation and I could talk to these particular panellists all day long. Um, please join me in virtually thanking and giving a big hand to Eva Foskia from IF Architecture. Ben Shuri from Attica Restaurant and Jeremy McLeod from Breathe Architecture. Thank you all for joining me. I'm Pat Nurse and good afternoon. Thank you, Pat. Thanks, Bye, Pat. everyone. Uh, see you, Eva. See you, Ben. Bye.